This week on Siskel and Ebert, down-to-earth angel John Travolta confounds skeptics Andy McDowell and William Hurt in Michael. Shirley MacLaine and Jack Nicholson return for more Terms of Endearment in the Evening Star. And Woody Harrelson sells Skin and Scandal in The People vs. Larry Flint. John Travolta plays an angel who smokes and drinks but believes that all you need is love in the new movie Michael, one of six big holiday pictures we're reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert, and I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is Michael, and surprisingly, the best parts of this picture have nothing to do with John Travolta's angel character. It's all of the supporting characters who are so much fun to watch. And here are those characters. They work for a supermarket tabloid edited by Bob Hoskins. William Hurt plays a reporter assigned to go from the Chicago headquarters to Iowa to interview and photograph a man described to be an angel. We'll put it on the front page. Bold. Some white, fluffy clouds. There you go. A drift of sky. You got it. Along for the ride, his co-workers, a ramshackle journalist played beautifully by Robert Pastorelli, and a mysterious new employee who describes herself as an angel expert, played by Andy McDowell. Well, we don't know exactly how it works with angels. How it works? If he's in the room, then you're with him. If he's somewhere else, then you're not. And that's why we can't see him now. He's not here. Are you impaired in some way that I haven't noticed, miss? Finally, we do meet the John Travolta character, and he really is an angel who has a magnetism that draws women, much to the consternation of the reporters. Yeah, yeah. It was right around the time I invented standing in line. You invented standing in line? Mm -hmm. Before then, everybody just milled around. It was a mess. The angel's message? Pretty obvious. Remember what John and Paul said? The apostles. No, the Beatles. All you need is love. For all of its talk about love, Michael does not achieve any epiphanies. The Travolta character is too obviously drawn. I'm also tired of the way that director Nora Ephron relies on vintage pop music tunes to move her films along. But the script of Michael is sharply written, and the supporting cast is beautifully constructed and played. They work together as a unit, and on that basis, a marginal thumbs up. Thumbs up for me, too. I don't mind pop music, nor Ephraim shouldn't be singled out when every single person does pop music in every other movie. No, but she uses, a lot, she uses a lot of it okay. in place of a, of a scene. It's well, not just it background. It just, she does musical ear, interludes a lot more than anybody else. It doesn't bother me. And what I also did like was the Travolta performance, which I think is interesting in the way he's so laid back. And he gives, it's almost like parables, and that when he gives his lessons, they're little wacky asides. And then talking about his duties as an angel, like he invented standing in line, and he's a writer too. What did you write? Uh, Psalm 85. Of course, they weren't uh, numbered at that time. I think the dialogue, you mentioned the dialogue, yes. is very well written in his case too, so I maybe like the movie a little more than you did. I want to reemphasize Robert Pastorelli's work. We know the kind of journalist he's playing, this tabloid hack, mm -hmm. who is still very sharp. Mm -hmm and he's got that character down pet. It's a real good supporting That's a nice detail that he is less important to the newspaper than his pet dog, yeah. <laughs> which is the paper's uh, mascot. Okay, next movie, and our next movie is a very smart and funny new film by Albert Brooks, a man who doesn't make many films, but they're almost always worth waiting for. It's named Mother, and it stars Brooks and Debbie Reynolds in a terrific performance, and the story of a man whose second marriage breaks up. When he turns to his mother for encouragement, he feels that what he mostly gets is subtle criticism. Buy yourself some new clothes. Why? Well, because the last time I saw you, I just thought you could look better. Look better than what? Well, just look better. You want to meet somebody? Well, I don't want to trick anybody into liking me. He decides that all of his problems with women started at home with his mother, and so he determines to move back in with Mom and start all over again from the beginning. This does not go so smoothly. What's up, Lead? Um, no. I made some salad. I have some meatloaf. I don't eat meat. Oh, that's right. This Jeff who loves it. 
Uh, I'll have some salad. Well, don't have salad just for my sake. No, no, I'll have it. Are you sure you want salad? Yes, I want salad. Debbie Reynolds will probably get an Oscar nomination for this performance, which is a sly little masterpiece of good comic timing. That's a lot of cheese. Got it in hunks. Mother. Look, look at the date. It's mm -hmm. three years old. Well, it's been in the freezer. Yeah, but how cheap was it that you wanted to buy this much of it? I mean, this is wonderful cheese. It comes from Switzerland. Very hard to get. How could it be hard to get? It's all here. I don't want the cheese. Now, nah, dear. Mother, stop. I don't want any. I don't want any. Well, stop. Well, please, like this old minute. house. Well, Anyone who has ever had a mother, which is probably a pretty large proportion of our viewing audience, is going to find scenes to identify with and laugh over in this movie. Brooks has made a very funny comedy here, but he has found most of his laughs in situations that ring true. Mother is one of his very best films, and a lot of the credit goes to his perfect casting choice of Debbie Reynolds. She is fine. She's terrific, um, and it's properly titled Mother because I think the most interesting character is her character. Mm -hmm. She's fascinating and if you mm -hmm. focus on her rather than his throwaway lines which we've seen him do before uh, you know the slight ridicule of somebody being inconsistent or th some of those jokes mm -hmm. I've seen all that uh, I wish he had been I wish he had written his character up to the level of her character because she's a well, real you know, special creation Brooks makes a movie every three or four years so right. it's not like you get tired of him is it I uh, mean, no it's very familiar though because he is so good that uh, no, I knew exactly. But you know, when some somebody is from. really good at something, I like to go see them again and again. It's well, like a great pianist. Even even though he's good again tonight, it's okay that he was good last then night. Then you ought to go see Real Life, which you gave a negative review to his very first film. Mm, it's a good one. I was one. waiting for that. Uh, it took you a little longer than I expected. Coming up next, Woody Harrelson stars as the publisher of the raunchy Hustler magazine, taking the court in the People versus Larry Flint. If you don't like Hustler magazine, don't read it. I don't. Don't be so melodramatic. You don't want to quit me. I'm your, your dream client. I'm the most fun, I'm rich, and I'm always in trouble. That's Woody Harrelson as Hustler Magazine founder Larry Flint, who began life as a redneck running moonshine and ended up as an embattled publisher whose right to print his tasteless skin magazine would be validated by no less than the Supreme Court of the United States. The People vs. Larry Flint is a major success from Cuckoo's Nest director Milos Forman, defending America's First Amendment freedom. Hoping to represent Flint, accused of obscenity, is a lawyer played by the red-hot young actor Edward Norton. You're pretty far out there, even for the guys who do a lot of this stuff, okay? I am interested in your case. The problem you've got is very definitely what I know best, and I am good at what I do. What, are you specialize in porn? No, 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 I don't, I don't specialize in porn. I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, I don't particularly like what you do. I specialize in civil liberties. The film also focuses on Flint's private life, which of course he often made public. His great love is a former stripper, Althea Leisure, played by Courtney Love in a rich performance of devotion and desperation. Because I only want to be with you. You're the only man I want to be with. I want this ring on my finger. The film spans two decades, and Flint later in this story is paralyzed in an assassination attempt. That only makes him more outrageous in court when he's asked to reveal a source. Your Honor, I'd like a moment no, with my client. I don't need a moment. It is my right under the freedom of the First Amendment to protect my sources. Listen, listen, listen to me. Don't think of anything. Hey, hey, Let me talk. shut up. Relax, Alan, relax. Larry Flint did more than publish porno pictures. He also took on some very big targets in the 1970s and 80s, including the right to satirize the Reverend Jerry Falwell. Here, he and his lawyer argue over appealing that case to the Supreme Court. They're afraid if they let you in the court, you're going to wear a diaper or throw oranges at the justices, and they should be, Larry, because in all the times you've gone to the court asking for help, you've never once demonstrated any respect for its institutions and procedures. The People versus Larry Flint works as a touching love story and as a document of the conservative forces that were unleashed in this country in the 1980s, as well as it is a ringing defense of America's freedoms. Courtney Love is a standout in her role. This is a good and important movie. Yeah, you know, it works in an interesting way, too. Milos Forman, of course, the director, came to this country from uh, Czechoslovakia, right. where his movies were repressed by a government over there. Here he's talking about somebody who's being repressed here. But Larry Flint is not making Milos Forman movies. He's publishing one of the sleaziest magazines in history. And so the point the movie makes is made very well by Larry Flint himself, who says if the 
Constitution will defend a scumbag like me right. than it will defend you. And that's right. the important thing uh, that the, the message that this movie has. I also want to talk about it as a movie. And I want to go with the drama of the Courtney Love character. This is a very rich character who goes through lots of changes in the, in the picture. And Courtney Love is equal to every single one of them. Her character would make a very good oh, movie yes. all by herself. Oh, I agree. You know, here's someone who's only had a few small roles in right. movies before. She's basically known as a rock star. This is a challenge, this role that would daunt any professional right. actress who had been working for 10 years, and she steps into it, and she does it brilliantly. This yeah. woman is probably a better actress than she is a singer. Well, she's a very good actress, that's for sure. When we come back, Shirley MacLaine stars in The Evening Star, a sequel to Terms of Endearment. This is a date. Maybe it's not a date in the sense that we're on our way to sleeping together. Why is that such a preposterous idea? Let's discuss that. Are you having an affair? Well, well Hector, you're in no position to be inquisitive or jealous. That's a scene from early in the evening star where life goes on for Aurora Greenway, played by Shirley MacLaine. The regulars in her kitchen are her housekeeper, Rosie, played by Marianne Ross, and her former lover, the general, played by Donald Moffat. MacLaine, of course, played Deborah Winger's mother in Terms of Endearment, the wonderful 1983 film. Mother and daughter had a touchy and tempestuous relationship, but after her daughter's death, Aurora took on the responsibility of raising her three grandchildren. And now, history repeats itself, and she has a touchy relationship with a rebellious granddaughter played by Juliette Lewis. I hate that you're going away again. I never know where you are. I worry all the time. I have to go through Patsy to get to you. I really hate that. Okay. I'll give you my phone number. If you promise me, you'll never, ever use it. The housekeeper thinks Aurora needs help and tricks her into seeing a counselor played by Bill Paxton. It appears that he needs help, too. He's a showgirl. Vegas. Really? <laughs> She's my mother. <laughs> she is. What? She's got the best legs on the line. Oh, she's awesome. Toward the end of the film, another character from Terms of Endearment turns up. It's that hotshot former astronaut, played by Jack Nicholson, who has since married and started a family. Chloe, light of my life. Garrett, she's so gorgeous. She's gonna be in fourth grade. She must have been a beautiful bride. I guess the fundamental thing to say about The Evening Star is that I can't see any reason for this movie to exist. It doesn't have the intelligence and dramatic tension of the first film. It plays more like one of those sitcoms where the neighbors are always walking in and out of your house and telling you how to run your life. The most memorable scenes in terms of endearment were the ones where Deborah Winger got sick and died and so they must have analyzed Terms of Endearment, and for this movie, they include no less than three death scenes. You know you're in trouble when the best scene in the movie is when they're scattering the ashes. Oh, yeah, this is a, a complete loser. I'm really stunned. I don't know what the motivation was on the part of Shirley MacLaine, who really has a pretty good detector for garbage. Uh, and, there, and it is garbage because mm -hmm. uh, it's just making us think uh, scenes that trigger our memory of, the, of a much mm -hmm. better picture, mm -hmm. including the Nicholson stuff in which they get in the car and go along the beach again. I mean, it's kind of yeah. shameless mm -hmm. reworking. I'm sure everybody got paid very well, and I suppose they deserve more money for their first project. Maybe that's how they rationalize it, but we get stuck with the bill as a ticket price and time. We sure do. You know, at the end of the film, Nicholson comes on and has one great line, which I won't quote because it's the only thing you're going to enjoy in the movie, so you might as well get the chance to enjoy it if you see the movie. But that movie reminded me of the electricity and the edge and the originality of the original James L. Brooks picture. So rent it. Everything else yeah. here is just a pale rent shadow. Rent that. It's been a long time since you've probably seen it. Rent Good that. Idea. Don't be suckered into this. Good idea. Coming up next, another classic novel is brought to film, Henry James's The Portrait of a Lady. Tough version of Henry James' classic novel, The Portrait of a Lady. Nicole Kidman plays an American woman in England in the 1870s who turns her back on the opportunity for an establishment marriage. Here she explains to her cousin her refusal to marry a rich suitor. It's not my fate to give up. You call marrying Lord Warburton giving up? It's getting a great deal, but it's giving up other chances. Chances for what? I don't mean chances to marry. I mean... From life. Instead, she is drawn to a mysterious, sinister gentleman played by John Malkovich at his oiliest best. 
What I wish to say is that I find I'm in love with you. More of his true character is revealed after he becomes convinced that she's preventing his daughter from marrying a rich man. On the contrary, I took great interest in it. When you told me you counted on me, I accepted the obligation. I was a fool to do so, but I did it. You pretended to do it. Where is the letter you told me you'd written? I haven't the least idea. The other key relationship in the film is between the Malkovich character and the one played by Barbara Hershey, another American who has long been abroad. She, too, is on the make, and they are a perfect self-destructive fit. You have made me as bad as yourself. You seem to me quite good enough. The Portrait of a Lady is not a conventionally likable film. Jane Campion does nothing to take the edges off the novel. If anything, she intensifies the concept of Americans on the make in Europe. This, in some ways, is an angry film about women selling themselves out. I didn't enjoy watching this picture in a conventional way, but I certainly admired the director's approach. Uh, there was a lot in it that I admire, but there was a question I had, too, although I recommend the film. Uh, the Portrait of the Lady is one of my favorite novels and one of maybe only two novels in my whole life that has ever made me cry. And what I found curious here is that in the novel, she decides to marry the artist for basically idealistic reasons. And in the movie, she does it for basically masochistic reasons, right. because the Malkovich character is at no point in any way plausibly likable or idealistic. So therefore, it's very confusing as to exactly why she does that. I think the, the explanation is that she's running from something that she clearly doesn't want. And I don't think she picks up on it very clearly, as quickly as you may suggest. Maybe not. And then the other problem is, of course, that the key character is the cousin who has given her this money in order to let her have freedom, and unfortunately, the money has only bought her slavery. And there was a deathbed scene between them in the novel that I think is more moving than in the movie. On the other hand, the, the final movie image? is very beautifully photographed. It's very beautifully realized. The character, Barbara Hershey, is terrific. Nicole Kidman, interesting. So I liked it. But I don't think it really does the movie, ju well, the novel justice. Well, uh, all I'll say is that I, I won't get a level of crying, but the final sequence in the picture is a very bold visual statement that is quite powerful by okay, Jane Okay, when we, when we come back, Walter Matthau and Ossie Davis meet in the park and look back on long and perhaps slightly imaginary lives in I'm Not Rappaport. Luxury service in Southern California style adjacent to Beverly Hills on L.A.'s fashionable west side. The Century Plaza Hotel and Tower, a Western hotel. Our next movie is I'm Not Rappaport, which is based on a play by Herb Gardner and offers wonderful opportunities for two great actors, Walter Matthau and Ozzie Davis, to sink into cranky but lovable characters. Blind. Matthau plays an aging left-winger who is still involved in what he sees as the front lines of protest and social improvement. In Central Park, he has daily conversations with the superintendent from an apartment building played by Ossie Davis. Matthau is very flexible when it comes to the line between fact and fiction. The fact is, I think they got me in what they call deep cover. They keep you in this deep cover for years, like five, maybe 10 years they keep you there, till you're just like this regular person in the neighborhood. And then boom, they pick you out for the big one. There's a movement underway to force the retirement of the Ozzie Davis character, and Mathau defends him to the chairman of the building's tenants committee. You collect old furniture, old cars, old pictures, everything old but old people. Bad souvenirs, they talk too much. Even quiet, they tell you too much. They look like the future, and you don't want to know. A film like I'm Not Rappaport is like a holiday for actors like Ozzie Davis and Walter Matthau, and it's a pleasure to watch them working so joyfully together here. The play itself is basically a series of excuses for their verbal riffs. There's not only the plot about the building committee, but other subplots involving a tough guy in the park. They provide opportunities for the wonderful words and attitudes that Matthau and Davis spin out like concert conversationalists. Well, Roger, they perform it well, but I, I go to the, the core material, and I didn't enjoy watching this stuff. I mean... Uh, I, I, it clearly is a play. I, I don't know whether I would have enjoyed it more on stage. I would have been looking again at the material, and I, it's exactly what you say it is, but I'm looking at the glass half empty because what they're doing is meaningless. It's, it is an excuse for performance. Well, a lame excuse. all plays are an excuse for performance oh, Roger, at one level knocked, or you another. You just knocked at it. At one I'm level you, or you another. What I'm saying trivial. is that if it's performed well, then you're looking at these two actors doing what they do well, and it's a joy to see them doing no, it. You're looking at the two actors and finding joy. I'm, I'm looking, looking at the glass. right at the play. 
The you glass is half full. And I'm, and I'm saying it's clearly, and you said it too, on the core level of script, it's half empty. Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed this week. Two thumbs up for Michael with John Travolta as an archangel, although Gene thought the supporting characters are more fun than the lead. Two more thumbs up for Mother as Albert Brooks moves back in with Debbie Reynolds to try to put his life on track. I like both performances. Gene thought Debbie Reynolds was fresher and Albert Brooks was a little stale. Two thumbs up for The People versus Larry Flynn, a rough-edged portrait of an unsavory American original. Two thumbs down, though, for The Evening Star, a sequel to Terms of Endearment that never convinced...